Hello again, everyone. I'm doing this video series on how to build and understand a radar used for tracking the position of a small drone. And I've received great feedback and comments on the last few videos. And in particular, I was happy to find out that people have actually been using this code and building some of this stuff up, which, which is great. And again, I don't care what hardware you use. I just love that people are doing something and learning from that. And as part of that feedback, I've been talking with some folk on what they're seeing and how to clean up some of that received data. And to clean up that data, we really need to synchronize our FMCW chirps. This is something that I wasn't planning to cover until we got into the range Doppler radar plots, because that's when we're really going to need it. But I decided I should just tackle the subject now. It's a good topic, and I think it'll help answer a lot of questions. So this video will be about how do we synchronize our transmit chirps with our received data, and then how does that improve the range plots that we get? This kind of synchronization is very important in radar systems, so it's a good topic to get a handle on. In the last video, we talked about these frequency modulated linear waveforms. And if we transmit them and then use a matched filter to compare transmit to receive, we get a beat frequency. And this beat frequency is directly proportional to distance. So that's how we can do radar ranging with a continuous wave signal. And continuous wave is particularly important for short range radar, which is the system that we're working on now. And if you recall, our linearly frequency modulated waveform looks something like this. This waveform is shown as in the time domain, and it's a bit of an exaggerated view of the waveform versus time. But you can see that the frequency of the waveform changes over time, and then it repeats. But it's more helpful to just draw out that frequency versus time. So here I've drawn that out in red, and now you can see that sawtooth shape we talked about in the last video. This could also be a triangular kind of a shape, or it could have delays between the chirps. But the point is that this frequency chirp just repeats over and over. OK, so what's the issue with this? When we get data from Pluto, what are we doing? We're asking Pluto to record a certain number of samples of the voltage that it sees. And this is arranged into buffers of data. And each buffer will be many thousands of data points and will cover several milliseconds of time. So you get this buffer of sample voltage versus time. And for our stretch LO system, this sample voltage is the difference between the transmit and the receive waveforms. So we take an FFT of that, and that is what we plotted, and is the beat frequency versus time. And then sometime later, we ask for another buffer of data from Pluto. So that buffer is the same length of time, but probably has a different starting and ending point relative to the transmit chirp than what our previous buffer did. And we plot the FFT again. And it seems to look OK. It all works. But it's not ideal. And the reason it is not ideal is because our ramp is not perfectly linear. Let me show you by zooming in on what these frequency chirps really look like. So in blue is a rough sketch of what our actual frequency ramps look like. And our ideal ramp is the red dotted line. You can see there is a difference between them at the start of each ramp. And I should say that a lot of this is because we are using an analog loop PLL to control this LO ramp. Uh, that's the stretch processing we talked about in the last video. If we were creating this ramp digitally in a DAC, then this would look a lot better. But for us, what we have is this ramp that is not quite linear at all times. So our frequency ramps up, and then we want it to reset to the lower frequency. But that takes some time since it's an analog loop. And then there's probably a bit of overshoot, and then it races to catch up with where it should be. And then from that point to the end of the ramp, it's very linear. But when our Pluto receive buffer grabs a couple of ramps, it also gets some of that nonlinear portion. And that's not good, because all of our equations have been with the understanding that this would be a purely linear ramp. And this nonlinear portion has a different relationship with distance. And so it just ends up putting extra junk into our FFT plot. And that junk doesn't have any meaning to us not distance as we represented distance on the plot. So given this nonlinearity, what we really want is for our Pluto buffer to only capture the linear portion of the ramp, like this. If we could do that, it'll help to clean up our range plots. So how do we do that? The ADF4159 has a special pin called TX data. And when you toggle this pin, the ADF4159 will do one pre-programmed sequence. And of course, the sequence that we want it to do is one frequency chirp. So that is pretty easy to do, and I'll show you how to program that. But now we need to synchronize that TX data pin with something inside of Pluto that tells Pluto, start your receive buffer. If we can do that, then we'll get one receive buffer from Pluto, and we'll know that the chirp began at the very start of that receive buffer. And then we can parse out that data for just the linear portion of that ramp. And then we can toggle TX data again to get our next chirp. But there's another piece of this that we don't need right now. But we're going to need it in a couple of videos from now. And that is we'll want to have many of these ramps, and we'll want to know precisely when each of them occur. To do that, we could just toggle TX data repeatedly. But the Raspberry Pi has a real-time operating system with lots of stuff going on. 
So the timing of those toggles is not going to be very exact. It could vary by several milliseconds. And our entire chirp happens in a few hundreds of microseconds. So, so we need much more precise timing. So the way that we do this is we have Pluto and not the Raspberry Pi control the timing of when each ramp begins. So we start with a burst signal from the Raspberry Pi. And the timing of this burst ping doesn't really matter. It's just there to start the whole sequence. So that burst signal is an input to Pluto, and Pluto will then take that burst signal and control the timing of the pulses to the PX data pin. And then we'll just make the Pluto buffer large enough to capture as many ramps as we want. Right now, that is just one chirp, but in future videos, this will be like 64 or 128 chirps. The timing on Pluto is very precise, so Pluto will output TX data pulses at whatever interval loop that we program, and then we'll know the precise timing at the beginning of each of those chirps. Then we just parse out the linear portion of those ramps from that buffer of data, and of course, we can repeat this whole sequence again by toggling the burst pin again. Okay, so where are those pins on Pluto? The burst signal comes from the Raspberry Pi GPIO header, and it connects to the top right of Pluto's 14-pin header. It's pin L12N for people that want to look it up on the Pluto schematic. Then the TX data signal goes from Pluto to the ADF4159's TX data pin. That connects to the pin right next to burst on Pluto, and it's pin L10P on the Pluto schematic. And then what does the programming look like for this thing? Again, you can go to my GitHub page and find all the software. Uh, the Python script I'm using today is called FMCW Radar Waterfall Chirp Sync. And now that we're doing chirp synchronization, it's very important that you make sure that you're using the latest version of Pi ADI IIO, and also make sure that you're using the latest version of Pluto's firmware. This must be Rev 0.38 or greater. Okay, so here is that complete program. Again, it's on my GitHub page, and it's uh, FMCW Radar Waterfall Chirp sync. And there's really only three changes that I've made from the previous program. Let's go through those now. So the first change is to the ADF4159 PLL. We need to tell it to expect a pulse on the TX data pin and to start a ramp when it receives that pulse. So we do that just by setting this TX trig enable to high. It was zero before, but now we set it to one. And then our ramp mode used to be continuous sawtooth or continuous triangular, but now we're going to make it single sawtooth burst. So each time this TX data pin is toggled, it's going to emit one sawtooth ramp. But all the other parameters are going to stay the same from what they were in our last program. Next, and this is the biggest thing that we're doing, is we need to create the TDD controller. The TDD controller is programming inside of Pluto that is going to control all of the timing for us. All that timing that we just talked about, this is where we set it all up. So first we create the object called TDD using Pluto's IP address. And then we configure that TDD object as shown here. So TDD enable needs to be false while we're setting up the attributes for the object. So we set it false and then after we're finished setting it up, then we set it to true. We're going to use the external sync, so we set that to true. We can set up a delay here. Here it's one that probably should be zero. In most cases, it's going to be zero. I think I was just messing around with it. I forgot to change it back. How far apart is each toggle of TX data is set by this frame length milliseconds command. So here I'm just setting it basically to the ramp time plus just a little bit of extra buffer. However, we're only doing one chirp. Next week, when we do the range Doppler plotting, this will be probably 64 or 128. But for right now, we're just doing one chirp. And then we set up the timing of channels 0, 1, and 2. Channel 0 controls the timing of the TX data output. And channel 1 controls the start timing for Pluto's receive buffer. You're pretty much going to always use the times that I've set up here. But I will show you a slide right after this where I go through what all of these times mean. And if for some reason you needed to adjust them, you could see exactly what they do. Channel 2 is for the transmit buffer of Pluto. For us, we're not doing anything with the transmit buffer. We are transmitting, but we're not imposing a timing relationship between the transmit and the receive buffer. So we don't need to mess with that. So I've just turned off Channel 2 timing. And then finally, we set TDD enable to true and that locks in all these values. Now what we're going to do is every time that we want to grab a buffer of data from Pluto, we're going to toggle the burst pin from the Raspberry Pi. We toggle it low, high, low. 
then we read that buffer of data from Pluto, and then we process it just like normal. Except that for each chirp, we're going to strip away everything that's not in the linear range of that chirp. So that's what we're doing in this for loop here. And at the end of that, all we're left with is just the linear portion of each chirp. That linear portion then, we process just like normal. We get the FFT and we plot it. So let's try this out and see what this looks like. Okay, so here's what that new waterfall plot looks like now. Again, this is just the FFT for one chirp, and it is only the most linear portion of that one chirp. You can see that it looks pretty different from what we saw in the last video. There's far fewer spikes to see. Uh, and there's also less kind of stringiness. That, that's mostly because we're just doing one chirp instead of laying multiple chirps on top of each other. And we can change the waterfall levels to accentuate just that peak that we want to track. So that looks very nice. And just like last week, we can change the chirp bandwidth. And you can see the effect that that has. Here I'm reducing it to 250 megahertz. And you can see that my beat frequency is now half of what it was at 500 megahertz. So that all seems to be working really well. And hopefully everyone can see the improvement now that we get from synchronizing chirps and gathering just the most linear portion of each chirp. Now, for anyone that really wants to dig into all the controls there, this is what the, all the timing parameters look like. And I want to especially thank UNET for creating this TDD engine and helping me understand and use it. One of the other interesting things you can do is you can also control the transmit buffer. So you can synchronize transmit to the receive buffer. This could be useful if you are doing digitally created chirp waveforms or some kind of coded radar waveforms. But I'm not doing that stuff, so my channel 2 is disabled. Now, I'm still transmitting, but my transmit buffer has no particular timing synchronization with my receive buffer. But again, that is fine for this use case. And I should say that this chart is just my understanding of what the Pluto firmware is doing. But the true source for all of this is the code and the explanation found at the link shown. Also, if you need help with this or have follow-up questions, you must post them to the Engineer Zone link shown. Please don't post your questions on this in the comments here. Those kinds of technical support questions are all supported by the experts at Analog Devices, and, and, and that's not necessarily me. So I hope that was helpful, and I hope it explained a bit about how this works and where we want to take it uh, when we use this radar. I'm going to film the CFAR targeting video also today and hopefully post that soon. Uh, I feel like I've been kind of letting too many weeks pass between videos, and we just have a couple left to finish out the series. I I've kind of been waiting to get my commercial drone license so I can film the final video, but I just received that, so I should be able to wrap up the series pretty soon. So if any of these videos sound interesting, Please subscribe and you'll be notified when these videos are available. And thanks again for watching.